My name is Chad Boyd. Um, I've been giving some secret presentations yesterday and today. This is my last one. Uh, last one for you guys for today as well. So I'll try not to keep you here too long. But um, we're going to talk about um, solid state drives and flash storage today and the impact that those will have um, primarily on SQL Server, but we'll, all, we'll also discuss um, general application usages. My guess is that most people here are developers, or most people here are developers opposed to administrator and architect. Yeah, any administrators? That's what I figured. So, um, so we're going to cover some uh, discussion of the impact of solid state drive on traditional application workloads as well, uh, similar to just the Windows OS um, or you know custom applications that you might um, write today, and how that uh, or how solid state impacts um, I/O as a whole. Um, so we're going to hit on a couple of different things. First thing we're going to cover is what a solid state drive actually is. Um, we're going to cover some of the benefits. Um, we'll talk through some of the different types of I.O. and which applications and what types of operations they apply to. Um, specifically with SQL Server, there's drastically different uh, patterns and uses for <coughs> data files and different um, configurations, um, et cetera, et cetera. The same would hold true or the Windows OS as a whole. Um, we're going to compare solid state to your traditional hard disk drives um, in both scenarios, traditional applications as well as SQL Server. Um, I do have a lot more performance um, and scenario-based information uh, regarding SQL Server, but it would also apply to um, traditional applications that generate the same types of bio patterns and sizes. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the trends in the industry that are actually benefit, benefiting uh, solid state drives. Um, there's actually quite a few trends uh, today, um, many that I'm sure you could think of off the top of your head, maybe a couple that don't come to mind right off uh, the bat. And then we'll map all that stuff to SQL Server specifically. Um, so what is a solid state drive? Well, your traditional hard drive is made up of a platter and spindle. It looks like a record player, basically. Yeah. Underneath. Um, has everybody here ever seen a physical hard drive, know what it looks like. Um, so you know that there's physical moving hardware. You've got a platter that spins, and you've got a disk arm that moves left and right. Um, so that's latency and seek time. Um, so anytime you submit an I.O. request um, to a particular spindle, that platter has to spin and that I.O. arm has to move. Uh, we'll talk about that throughout the presentation. Solid state drives, on the other hand, um, are non-mechanical, with no physical parts. Um, they're basically a semiconductor technology. Um, they use flash media to store your data. So given that there's no moving parts, um, that, right, that alone uh, should tell you that reliability of a solid state drive is much higher than your traditional hard disk drive today. Anytime you introduce moving parts into anything, whether it's uh, computer technology or um, anything that, that humans would make, um, you're introducing uh, error uh, possibility. So the fact that there's no moving parts increases the reliability right off the bat. Uh, things, uh, both reliability but as well um, in terms of uh, power consumption, heat dissipation, um, and the fact that it can withstand not only higher and colder, higher and lower temperatures, but also more vibration, um, more uh, stress uh, given that mostly because there's no moving parts, um, and I'll show you a, a small video of that um, here in a bit. Power consumption, um, again, no moving parts, power consumption is extremely low. Uh, we'll, I'll show you a chart that, that lays the differences out. Uh, performance is much higher. We'll discuss that as well. And heat generation is low. Again, mostly because of the fact that there's no moving parts. Okay? The one downside, or the biggest downside, uh, not the only one, but the biggest downside to solid state drives and flash technology today, particularly in commodity hardware like laptops and as well in um, broad enterprise adoption, is the fact that the cost to the storage capacity ratio is still pretty high. So your cost per gigabyte is much higher than your traditional like SATA 2 drives today, particularly the ones that, I mean, you've got SATA drives today that push you know, one terabyte or more on a single flat, so um, for a very low cost. Um, 
a quick chart to, to highlight the adoption of solid state drives and flash technology um, in the industry today. You can see back in 2006, there were very few. Um, that's projected to exceed in 2011, <coughs> go off the charts, basically. These are units in millions of dollars. Uh, it's projected in 2011 that there's gonna be uh, just under 35 million uh, units sold. Um, so the, the adoption of solid state in the industry is taking off, but um, on, in the next few slides, as, and, and as you can probably figure out, a lot of that isn't driven from, again, your enterprise storage platforms or your commodity hardware like laptops. It's more from like your mobile devices. Um, all your mobile devices, iPhones, iPods, um, Zooms, uh, mobile phones, you know, things like that, those all use some form of flash or solid state technology for storing how much of the data you can store. Um, so let's start, let's, let's discuss some of the different types of I.O. Um, there's two big types of I.O., random and sequential. And they're two drastically different patterns of I.O. Um, random I.O., as you can see on, on screen, is your small, short bursts of I.O. for small, relatively small amounts of data that are spread across the disk or spread across multiple disks. Okay, give me um, this record from a database or give me uh, this section from a configuration file. Or at the OS level, it could be um, write this section of memory to the page file so I can free up room for this other application that needs memory now. Um, that's all your random I.O. DLLs um, are actually heavily <coughs> random I.O. So in your app dev world, um, even though DLLs are encapsulated in a single file and are typically contiguous on your disk, um, when a DLL is loaded or accessed, that's typically accessed in anywhere between five and 15 random IOs as opposed to one sequential IO. Some of that has to do with the memory architecture of the Windows platform. Some of that has to do with um, just development practices in general. Um, registry access and all your system meta metadata, that's typically 99% random IO access. Sequential IO, on the other hand, um, you see it at times such as boot up. Um, one big sequential I.O. operation that happens on typically every boot is the initialization of your page file. Okay, so if you have a page file that's set to on, on many servers, on four bit servers today, you might have um, a page file that's set to grow to 10, 20, 50, or 100 gigabytes on boot. That's one very large sequential operation, or many very large sequential operations. Um, anytime you hibernate, you wake up, it's very similar to a boot process, minus your page file. Um, and then your application load and your document load. So if you open up a Word document, there's typically large sequential I.O. operations there, or PDF files. Or if you fire up an application, um, you know, typically typical applications that you might write yourself, or any off-the-shelf application that you might run on your PC. Those are typically uh, generate higher numbers of sequential IOs. Once they're running, then small amounts of random IOs fire uh, very frequently. Okay? Um, so traditional, these, these traditional types of applications, whether it's uh, custom built or third party or built into your OS platform, um, hard drive performance really is typically uh, measured in the number of IOPS per Know, IO operations per second as opposed to your overall transfer rate. You might have a hard drive and a, and a um, controller that can support three gigabits of throughput per second, but that really doesn't matter if you're firing a thousand random IOs because you're not going to come close to touching that, that, that uh, max data transfer rate. You just want those small IOs to fire as fast as possible to give a, res a fast response time to the end user. So in your typical app dev type scenarios um, or OS type applications, um, you'll sacrifice the transfer rate for a higher number of IO operations per second most any day. And the database world, as we'll talk about here in a bit, that's totally different. Um, one thing to note is that in, in a typical hard drive, a typical like, traditional hard drive today, it could be a SATA, it could be SAS, it could be whatever, 
they can perform anywhere from four to, in some cases, even 128 kilobytes of uh, data access in the same time, in the same amount of time they can, they can pull in 8K. And if you have a sequential operation that pulls 120, a single I.O. operation that pulls 128K of data versus 8K of data, they'll finish in almost the exact same time that 128K of data is, is contiguous on this. Why is that? Because 95 to 99 almost percent of the time for I.O. access on a traditional hard drive spindle is the platter spinning and the arm moving. Okay, the, the actual time to transfer the data from the drive to the OS is very minimal compared to the time it takes those mechanical pieces to spin and, and swing back and forth. Okay. Um, OS transfers, you can see here you've got, we're talking about random and sequential. You obviously also have reads and writes. So you have random reads and random writes, sequential reads and sequential writes. On a traditional OS platform or active type application, random reads will typically um, account for over half the total I.O. operations that you're going to perform. Okay? Random writes will account for another 10 to 15 percent. Um, now these again, these are your traditional applications that run on you know, your OS or app dev type applications. So those random accesses, those random access type operations account for anywhere from 60 to 75 or 80 percent of the I.O operations that you're actually doing. Um, I guess this is just another graph that shows you that in this is this in particular um, four to eight K reads for, account for over half the actual of the total read transfers in a in a typical user session. So um, to kind of back up or to reiterate a lot of the things that we've talked about um, on the left here, you've got um, a standard, a, a, a pretty a, a commodity solid state drive today. I believe this is based on the Samsung solid state drive. Um, in a traditional uh, three gigabit uh, hard disk drive, you can see the different mechanism types. You can see the operating temperatures. The disk drive over here is generally higher operating temperature than your solid state drive. The noise from your solid state drive is nil. Um, noise from my typical hard drive most of the time is relatively low. I put 0 0.x because it could be anywhere from 0 0.001 to 0 0.4. You're right, the large sequential write, it's usually louder than if you're just idling in PowerPoint presentation. If you've ever been sitting somewhere and your disk and your computer's sitting next to you and it starts kicking off a backup or something, and you start hearing that sound and that noise in the background. A lot of that's the fan, and some of that's the hard drive as well. Um, performance is a big one. Your solid state drives can typically sustain um, a random read of 100 megabytes per second. Contrast that with your uh, typical SATA drive today, which is 59 megabytes per second. Uh, that's nearly double the solid state drive. On your writes, your solid state drives can typically sustain anywhere from 60 to 80, 80 is kind of the high end. Um, and your SATA drives can sustain typically around 60 megabytes per second. And that's mostly random line, but we'll talk about some sequential differences as we get to um, the SQL Server specific things here in a minute. Your seek time on a solid state drive is fixed. It never changes. You could access data from anywhere on the, on the drive, and it's going to take you 0.11 milliseconds right now, or whatever the manufacturer's specification is. It does not change. Unlike your typical hard drive uh, platter today, it's variable. If the drive is already in the location for the data you're trying to access, you're going to have a very low seek time because the platter and spindle doesn't have to move. As soon as that platter and spindle has to move, you're going to um, drive up your seek time. Power consumption is a big one. Um, a, a, this particular solid state drive uh, takes one watt of power when it's active, 0.1 watts idle, even less when it's hibernating or off or um, stay on standby. Um, compare that to your, your traditional SATA spindle, and it's uh, all just under four times active and quite a bit more when it's even idle. 
So power consumption is much higher in your traditional spindles than your solid state. Operating vibration, you can see that your, your solid state can withstand a vibration that's exponentially larger almost than um, the operating vibration that can be sustained by a traditional platter. Um, your shock resistance is very similar. Again, solid state drive, no moving parts that can withstand a lot of vibration and a lot of shock. You can drop, my laptop that I have here actually contains a solid state drive. Um, I dropped it on the floor, I picked it up and shaken it while I'm running a backup and you'll never see a problem. I actually have a small video that will show you that there's people that do a bottom on to that and you just shake it. Um, the reliability or endurance, a solid state drive has a typical mean time between failure over two million hours. Okay, your standard, even your best SATA drives today have a mean time between failure of under 700,000. Okay, so 700,000 is, 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 if you get 700,000 hours at a typical SATA drive, you're doing really well. Okay, so that's double, nearly triple um, on the solid state side. Okay. Um, one thing that does Another uh, negative, so to speak, of the solid state drive is what, what this graph is showing you here is the number of I.O. operations on the uh, x-axis and on the y-axis is the transfer size or your I.O. size. Down here is a 0.5 kilobyte, 1 kilobyte, 2 kilobyte, 4 kilobyte, up to 1,024 kilobytes or 1 meg. As the I.O. As the I.O. sizes grow, the number of IOs per second that can be sustained by a solid state drive grows closer and closer to those of your traditional spindles today. Um, as you'll see in some of the numbers that I'll show you here as we get through the presentation, um, <clears throat> traditional spindles today typically would be recommended and can still outperform your solid state drive, the flash drives for large sequential IOs, which you see a lot of for particular types of operations in a database platform. Random ions, however, the solid state drive is, um, blows it over the water. So some of the trends in the industry today that benefit solid state technology or flash technology. Uh, the one on the top um, should be fairly obvious, the green movement. Uh, every corporate you know, data center is under pressure to move to more green data centers. Power consumption needs to be shrunk because power costs are going up, cooling costs are going up. So the temperature of the systems you want to cool needs to be shrunk. Um, everything about data centers today, 75 to 80% uh, of the costs of a data center over a five year uh, term are typically related to power and cooling. Um, so a lot of people think that the, you know, upfront building a data center, power and cooling aren't much of a consideration because your big costs are the, location, you know, building the facilities to support 24-7, 365 operations, and then obviously filling it with all your hardware. Um, over the life of a data center, the power and cooling consumption will far out, out, uh, outgrow the costs of your upfront uh, purchases. Um, a trend for SSD is just the sheer amount of data that people and, and companies are storing today. Um, it is. It used to be three to five years ago. I've been working with SQL Server for ten to twelve years. It used to be a three to five years ago. If somebody told me they had a one terabyte size database, they were in the top fifty in the world um, on SQL Server. Um, today, if you tell me you have a one terabyte database, you're probably not in the top fifty percent. <laughs> um, Give you an idea of some of the scale. Um, I'm going to be working with a customer starting in three weeks that stores three and a half petabytes of data. Um, so that's 3,500 terabytes. Um, and that's not even the largest uh, SQL Server deployment in the world. Um, so just the sheer amount of data and the sheer number of, uh, you know, you talk about things like uh, YouTube and Facebook. And things like that, where people are continually sharing data, wanting to stream media content of all kinds and all types, that takes a lot of storage. And as that storage goes up, 
They want the response time to remain the same. It's very hard to make a three and a half petabyte database perform the same as a three and a half terabyte database, and even harder to make it perform like a three and a half gigabyte database. Um, so storage bottlenecks or IO bottlenecks are likely becoming more and more uh, frequent as that data size goes up. Mobility, obviously, like we mentioned earlier, um, the whole the world is moving towards everything on your mobile device. But uh, those all run solid state and flash right now. Tiered storage is something that um, developers sometimes aren't aware of, administrators or, or storage architects typically are. Um, it's a relatively new concept, probably within the last five years at least, where it's become quite mainstream. Um, nearly all major storage vendors today supply a, a tiered storage solution. And the whole idea is to store your most frequently accessed, most recent data on a smaller number of expensive fast drives so that you don't have to purchase um, three and a half petabytes worth of 15K SAS drives. Um, instead, you can purchase for a lot of the data that's accessed infrequently or, or um, historical data that simply needs to be archived. You can store it on cheaper, uh, more dense SATA drives that are cheaper and, and you can you know, buy a single spindle up store up to a terabyte or more of information. <coughs> so that tiered storage is all about moving data down your, your tiers from your expensive fast drives to your cheaper uh, dense drives. Um, it's currently estimated uh, by IPC and some Gartner estimates that about there's a 75 25 split between performance optimized and capacity optimized storage today, meaning 75% of storage today is performance optimized storage, meaning they'll pay more money to get a fast drive, even though they don't need either all that space or maybe all the performance that will give you. 25% is capacity optimized, meaning um, they want to save money, store more information while um, sacrificing some performance, some throughput. It's expected to flip completely around um, in the next two to three years. So 75% will be capacity optimized, 25% performance optimized. And then one thing that doesn't, doesn't typically um, spread people is an obvious um, factor is connectivity. So particularly with things like uh, personal laptops, mobile devices, and whatnot, as the, as the usage of broadband, and you know, we talk about the Web 2.0 world today, Web 3.0 is already underway. Um, as that increased use of the broadband and storage in the cloud and distributed services goes up, there's a lower requirement for large amount of storage on my laptop. Uh, five years ago, if you told me that I would have a laptop that had 64 gigs of storage and that would be plenty for me, I would probably laugh at you because I would have needed 100, 200 gig storage space on my laptop just to store the things I needed to give presentations or do my work, let alone my MP3 files and videos and all the things that I want. Um, today, I've got a 64 gig solid state drive and I have about 30 gig free. I have a small external USB drive that stores about 200 gig of information and it has all the things that I access maybe once every six months. So let's map this stuff to SQL Server. So up to this point, we've talked a lot about traditional applications and traditional um, performance, uh, IO performance for not only commodity hardware, but also um, enterprise app dev type platforms and the types of I.O. Um, that they will perform. For SQL Server and most any database platform or uh, server, the I.O. usage is almost completely opposite. Um, database servers, SQL Server in particular, um, attempt to do everything possible to perform small numbers of I.O.s with large sequential operations. So if SQL Server has the option, if there's 100 pages of dirty data in cache that needs to be flushed to disk, if those 100 pages are contiguous on disk, SQL Server will perform one I.O. operation that's a large sequential write, as opposed to 100 um, small random operations. The reason for that is, even today with solid state, sequential operations 
are, are, are can be uh, finished faster. So like I told you earlier, your traditional uh, applications would sacrifice latency and throughput for a higher number of I.O. operations because you usually perform large numbers of small I.O. I mean, you want that response time as opposed to the, to, uh, as opposed to maximizing your throughput. Well, database servers are all about reading and writing data. It's what they do. Um, so they want to sacrifice number of I.O. operations for maximizing the throughput of the storage device. A database server is, gonna, is going to push the limitations of, of any storage device Thank to you. its limits much more than any traditional application would. If you think of things in SQL Server, um, when you think of checkpoints, read aheads, and the way that SQL Server or any most database servers work, they're completely geared to small number of IOs um, as sequential as possible. If you write um, data to SQL Server, so if you do an insert, update or delete, um, how many people think that that piece of data is actually flushed to your data files when you commit that transaction? It's not. It's sent to your transaction log, but it doesn't go to the data files when you finish that operation. It stays in cache. And then about every minute, or depending on how you configured your server, a background process comes along and sweeps through the, the buffer pool and the cache in memory and takes those dirty pages and pushes them to disk. And it'll sweep through and actually reorder pages so that they're more contiguous, so it can perform smaller numbers of IOs in a larger sequential fashion. Read ahead is just the opposite. If you perform, if you have a data warehouse, hopefully it doesn't happen on your OTP system, though it does frequently, but in a data warehouse scenario, if you've got to run a large query, um, and join two large fact tables together. So 10 million row fact table, 10 million row fact table, and you need to join the two together and return all rows. Um, SQL Server has a mechanism referred to as the read ahead mechanism, which will basically go ahead of the relational join and pull data into cache as fast as possible using large sequential IOs to try and keep the CPU busy. The CPU, um, was processing the request, and every time it needed new data, sent out a request to the I.O. subsystem to return that data and wait for it to come back. If your I.O., I mean, your CPU would never approach 20% capacity. But your storage system is always going to be slower than your CPU. It's just the way it is. So again, most things are geared toward performing large, I mean, uh, small number of I.O. operations in large sequential patterns. Um, the other issue with SQL Server is that um, those four types of patterns that, I, that, that we talked about, random reads, random writes, sequential reads, sequential writes, SQL Server um, has to be able to perform all four of them very well for any database server. Why? Because Microsoft doesn't know how you're going to deploy SQL Server. Are you going to deploy it as a data warehouse, as a relational data warehouse? Or are you going to deploy it as an OLTP system? Both of those systems have drastically different I.O. patterns. A data warehouse will typically have large reads um, and scan lots of data, whereas your OLTP system, you want to perform small um, I.O.s very frequently, more closely resembling your traditional application usage patterns. And of course, the other issue is, is that um, SQL Server is also dependent not only on some things like the types of data that that system supports or the distribution of that data, but also things such as fragmentation of the data, the way that a particular user um, deems to configure the system, or the way that a particular user chooses to write a T-SQL statement and have drastic impacts on how SQL Server can and does perform I.O. Um, even the uh, additions of SQL Server perform I.O. differently. Enterprise Edition is more aggressive about trying to flood the I.O. system because the assumption is made that the Enterprise Edition of SQL Server will be deployed on systems that have more advanced, larger I.O. systems. Whereas it's also assumed that the Express version will most likely be deployed on smaller systems with smaller I.O. subsystems. And that's generally true. 
So, um, next couple slides, I'm going to show you some results of some, some uh, tests I've done. I'm comparing your traditional hard drives to solid state drives in regards to SQL Server I.O. operations. Now, some of these I.O. operations would also map to traditional application usage. The, the most frequent for traditional application usage would be these top two, 8K random leads and 8K random writes. Now, in SQL Server, random writes would happen for checkpoints and interaction with temp TV. Random reads would occur with like index seats on an LTP system, you know, look, small lookups of small amounts of data, or if you have heavily fragmented structures. Okay, the more fragmentation introduced into your system, the lower the chance that SQL Server will be able to sequentialize that I/O. Why? Well, because the data isn't contiguous on disk. Fragmentation is the opposite of contiguous. Okay. Um, so here's all, anyway, I won't go through all of them, but we're going to go, the tests that I've done, um, and that I'll show you here in the next couple slides, have, were performed on four different systems um, in each of these types of IOs and patterns. Um, the largest one being on one thing like sequential read, which is typically what the, the type of IO pattern that your backup operations will perform. The 64 to 256 are mostly bulk operations. Um, could be bulk reads or bulk writes. Um, and these 8K, again, these are the ones that would be similar to your applications and look more like OLTP type activity. So the four systems that I use. Um, I use my laptop, which is sitting right here. Um, it has two 2.2 uh, gigahertz um, Centrino processors um, eight that, are, that each have 800 megahertz front side bus and four meg of L2 cache. 4 gig of RAM, it's running Vista Ultimate X64. And for storage, it has a single 64 gig solid state drive. My desktop I use, which is a, a quad core, 2 gigahertz, much larger CPU system, much larger memory, 16 gig of, of, of memory. It has two local drives, one 10K drive for boot, one 7.2K drive uh, for data. And I've got two servers. Server one is a mid, mid, a small to mid range server, a quad core, 16 gig of RAM. It's attached to a direct, uh, a Dell MD1000, which is a direct attached storage unit. And behind that, it's got two lines that have, uh, in total, 14 uh, SATA2, SATA2 7.2K drives um, in a RAID 5 configuration. And then my higher end server is an eight core, uh, three gigahertz server, 24 meg of LT cache, the 32 gig of RAM. And it's attached to an HP EVA 6100 SAN. Very expensive SAN. Um, it's got a log line with eight 15K SAS drives with a RAID 10 configuration, and in total, 40 15K SAS drives and RAID 10 configuration for data. Okay, so you'd obviously expect this server to completely demolish my thinky little laptop that's sitting up here giving you a PowerPoint presentation right now, while this server is probably turning through queries from people that are making a lot more money than I am right now. Um, and then of course, you would probably expect them to work their way down as we go through. That's a little fuzzier than I was hoping, but I'm gonna walk you through some of the things. Um, we, from what we've talked about, we would expect solid state drives would outperform traditional spindles on random operations, particularly random reads. It's a little fuzzy, but you can see here, this is my laptop. Um, in the test, it, it performed uh, 2,836 IOs per second, totally demolishing my desktop in the mid, small to mid-range server. Uh, the high-end server performed just under 5,000 IOs per second. So my laptop performed half of what that high-end server would, that, that cost about 600 grand uh, compared to my, I don't know how much I paid for this, 2,200 bucks maybe? Um, so you can see the cost per gigabyte here, 227 for my laptop versus $1,847 for that uh, high-end server. Now, of course, there were some scenarios where um, things worked out as expected. Sequential writes. Like I mentioned, I think, briefly earlier, um, solid-state drives still lag behind the uh, um,
these this will also be included with the um, the information the CDs or on the website that you get. It comes back live in the next few minutes, so gladly finish. But um, it'll also be up on my blog, if you down my blog address, or you can email. But basically, the last two um, couple slides um, basically just reiterated a lot of what we talked about, which was solid states lying behind a bit of potential rights and really uh, demolish systems when it comes to random IO access. So the next slide I was going to show you was um, some tests against a very fragmented system. So if you have a system like an OOPP system and you're not able to defragment it, but you know it's fragmented for whatever reasons, or if you don't even know it's fragmented and don't have a SQL Server database administrator that's able to even tell you if that's a problem or not. Um, the higher levels of fragmentation, um, the, the less sequential I.O. that SQL Server is going to be able to perform. So typically your performance for large range scan type operations are going to suffer. Um, most uh, storage vendors today, your big ones, Dell, HP, Hitachi, um, etc., all, all have um, high-end and mid-range storage platforms direct attached storage systems and SANs that come with solid state and flash configurations. Um, so it's right around the corner in terms of um, when it will be available um, to uh, mainstream enterprises. Obviously you can already get it in most commodity hardware. I have a laptop up here that hopefully still works and probably everybody has a cell phone in the pocket that, that contains it. Um, My battery is I did have a video. Um, the one video I was going to show you was um, a person that was basically holding two laptops one that had a traditional spindle and one that had a solid state drive. Um, they showed a boot up. Uh, they hit the power button on both of them, they were both running uh, Vista, might have been an XP. Um, the solid state drive machine boots, boots in about 32 to 33 seconds, and the traditional spindle drive boots in double that, one minute and 10 seconds. Um, the next test they did was opening a 24 meg PDF file, which would be a large sequential read operation um, for, for the first time it's loaded. Um, the solid state system opened it and had it ready to be used within two or three seconds. This is it's my machine. It's not that it's my machine. Uh, and the traditional spindle system took well over 15 to 16 seconds to load up um, that large data file. The next one, which is the one I really wanted to show you, was uh, the vibration testing, which basically two laptops were placed on a um, on a vibrating machine, and it measures the vibrations in terms of uh, um, hertz. And the solid state drive continued uh, to, to operate. They had some graphic running. And the, the traditional spindle, you see, cracked out at about uh, the number that was listed there. I think it was three hertz. The solid state drive continued to drive, continued to operate even after the machine reached the peak vibrating capacity, which I think was 1,000 hertz. It was still running long. Um, so that was, that was actually the one that. I was hoping to share with it. Um, with that, since I can't seem to get my laptop back up and running, um, any questions? What about the reliability of the What? The reliability of the flash memory. Sorry. Compared to the reliability compared to the spindle drive. Reliability yeah. of solid state versus um, spindle. Um, I, I can't remember what the numbers were, but the mean time between failure for a traditional solid state or flash based system is about 2 million hours. Um, contrast that with your traditional hard drive, which is about 700,000 hours or less, which means that typically, on average, um, by 700,000 hours of use, you'll see a failure on your traditional spindle, whereas on a solid state system, barring when you're giving a presentation, um, you'll get probably 2 million or more hours of use of it.
So much more reliable. Watch. It basically, the major contributor is the fact that there's no moving parts in this watch. So nothing to really break. Is there anything going to be? So they're saying that the rate 10 is repeated, but the rate 10 is on solid state. Rate 10 or, I'm sorry, what was the other one? Solid state. Okay, so if you have, so I, the question being using traditional spindles in a rate 10 configuration or a solid state. Um, also, it, it's not a, a black and white question, so to speak. Um, there would be some configuration of traditional spindles where it might be, it's going to depend on your workload, but say you have 10 spindles, 10 15k SAS drive, rate 10 together. Maybe that will, maybe that would match um, a single solid state in terms of randomizing performance. Maybe it'd be 20, maybe it'd be 30. It's going to depend a lot on your workload, the system, et cetera, et cetera. But there's going to be some number there where, as you rate 10 or any rate configuration, as you add spindles, um, it'll start matching what a solid state will give you. The biggest thing to measure is the cost of those, whether it's five, you know, if it's two SAS drives, or, you know, then you should go with two SAS drives most likely. Uh, because I think you can get four SAS drives or five SAS drives now for the same price of a single solid state. Um, your rate configuration would have a have a uh, impact on it. Rate zero versus rate ten versus rate five, rate fifteen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and the number of SAS spindles or traditional spindles that it would take will differ based on you know a variety of things. But personally, if I have the option between today an OTP system that I know performs a lot of random IO, purchasing um, a few so a solid state or flat state system versus traditional spindle system, I'm going to purchase the solid state system at least for my uh, tier one data, meaning maybe the last 60 days of data or something like that. Um, anything beyond that, it doesn't make sense to use the solid state for. Uh, one other interesting thing is a lot of people or a lot of the flat enterprise solid state systems today still need to be rated in some form because you know, even though they, they outlast traditional spindles by a wide range, people don't want to bet their entire company on it. Uh, the interesting thing is RAID 5 um, or even you know, RAID 6 or something like that on a solid state uh, back system is going to outperform or it's going to perform exactly the same as if you RAID 10 those same solid, spin, solid state spindles. That's drastically different from if you're working with traditional spindles. Uh, most of the time, a rate 10 configuration will outperform, at least on rights, your rate 5, um, the same number of spindles in a rate 5 configuration. It doesn't hold true on solid state back spindles. So there's absolutely no reason to do anything other than something like rate 5 or rate, rate 6, perhaps, um, if you're using solid state, because it's going to be a higher storage capacity and the same get response. So, um, that's another interesting consideration to keep in mind. You get the same level of performance um, from uh, a rate 10 system. You obviously have five more spindles, five more spindles, five more spindles, as opposed to um, a rate five solid state. Kind of brings solid state more in, in line with the uh, storage capacity because uh, cost of storage is still pretty high for solid state. Any other questions? Is there any cooperation <coughs> with uh, the traditional one or performance solid state? So it, the question is, is there any operation where the traditional spindles outperform um, solid state? And the answer is yes. Um, sequential writes today, um, most traditional spindles will outperform a solid state spindle, particularly as you approach larger sequential write sizes. So if you do a 64K or 128 sequential write, it might be uh, about even. As soon as you start getting into 128K or more sequential write operations, um, your traditional spindles will, will beat most solid state drives you know, in a one to one competition today. And the uh, results, what are you have shown? Um, the process speed for the servo, the, the process speed seems to be of 8 core, whereas uh, the solid state you mentioned uh, dual core. It was my, yeah, it was my last yeah. the dual core. So, I mean, more the process speed, and then this increases the improvements in performance. Um, so, that's an, it's, a, it's a good observation and a good question. So, was, the question was in, in, in terms of uh, the test that I ran, obviously the, the higher end server um, had eight way box with three gigahertz you know, enterprise class systems, and I think it was 32 meg of front uh, of L2 cache, et cetera, et cetera. 
versus my little dual core. My tests were all I.O. bound or geared towards forcing I.O. operations as opposed to um, giving benefit to the fact that the enterprise bus system had much more cash and much faster CPU. I actually, um, in, in the data that I'll include, I'll have it in a work spreadsheet, the Excel spreadsheet. There's actually two tabs, one where I forced the operations to be um, a max DOP of one, meaning only a single processor could be used for all operations, and one where it was max DOP of two. Obviously, um, when we're talking about solid state and traditional spin we're talking about I.O. That has nothing to do with it. Obviously, I'm not trying to sit, stand up here and say that my laptop would, would run your enterprise system better than, better than that system on the right. Because there's other factors on day-to-day -day things. It's not just I.O. because this system could hold 32 gig of data in cache, whereas my laptop can only hold four. It could run eight things in parallel at the same time, and I could only run two at half the speed. So in terms of overall system throughput, the one on the, on the right was blowing my laptop out of the water, no questions asked. But the test that I ran, I basically would run a test, flush the cache, run a test, flush the cache, run a test, flush the cache. But I was forcing I.O. Um, if I were to, I think in some of the fragmentation tests, I actually compared cold cache versus warm cache. Obviously, the three systems on the right blew my laptop away on warm cache scenarios because there was no I.O. occurring at all. Okay, any other questions? Well, sorry to cut it short, but um, I think my battery ran out and my power isn't working, so um, feel free to contact me at the um, address that was on the screen or on my blog, and I'll be happy to reply. Um, otherwise, have a good rest of the week and a good night. Thanks. Thank you.